Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you on this Sabbath day. My name is Casey. Um, it's nice to get to know the Grand Rapids extension of the family. I've never been here before, and uh, it's really nice. I see some familiar faces that I think I've seen at women's retreat and maybe at the conference office and probably in the travels that we all kind of seem to go on, camp meeting and that type of thing. But it's really, really nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having this Women's Day. Thank you for the gentlemen who participated in Women's Day. That was absolutely beautiful and so touching. What a beautiful song. So before we get started, um, I would just like to take a minute to pray and ask one more time for the Lord's blessing. If you would bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you so much. We do love you so much. And Lord, that song was just perfect. So we ask that you come and be with us, that you touch us with just the message that you want us to have um, in our lives so that we may serve you more fully, more completely, and spend time with you. Lord, we love you, and in this Sabbath day and in these special hours, we just ask you to come and be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me get a little organized here. I love the questions that were asked uh, today by the gentleman that was up here, and I have a question for you. It's not on my notes, but I was thinking about it as he was speaking, and I'm just wondering, what to you is the most wonderful expression of God's love, of his power in your life? And you can go ahead and raise your hand. I'll, I'll kind of interact with you a little bit. So what to you is the most powerful expression of God's power in your life? Peace. Peace is very powerful. When we don't have it, when we're not with Christ and we don't have it, it is something that we can't imagine, and when we do get it, it's pretty incredible. What else? I found joy. Yeah, that's a good answer. Joy is, is an expression of God's power because we can't get that really real joy anywhere apart from Christ. Yes? <coughs> Babies, yes, I saw a lot of babies here. You guys have a school, I understand, so full of kids. Babies are an expression of God's power. Yes? Imagination, imagination. good answer. Without God's creative power, we wouldn't have an imagination to think of those things. Well, for me, and in my life, the, the biggest expression of God's power has been transformation. And today we're going to take um, kind of a a different look at the scripture reading that we read today, the, the story of Mary and Martha. And um, it's not going to be your typical uh, Mary-Martha story or sermon. It's a little bit different. And we're going to talk about transformation. Transformation is important. That's what God's all about, because he's come to a fallen world and he's transforming us. And because we're still sort of kind of in the new year, I'm going to kind of tie it into the new year. So in the new year, many people want to transform their lives, right? You have people who make resolutions to lose weight, uh, to redo their finances, to get out of debt, to improve their relationships or their families. Sometimes it's to get a new home, maybe sell the one you have, get a new one or redo it, or get a new career. In the new year, transformations are on people's minds. And so today we're going to talk about that. Usually they only last a few weeks, a few days, a few weeks, maybe a few months if you're lucky, um, and then they're forgotten. If the transformation of our physical body, you know how hard it is to transform your physical body. If that's difficult, um, how hard is it to transform our characters? And I think every one of us sitting here, and as I look out at you, I like to think about who you were before you met Christ. And sometimes, you know, it's just my imagination. And I just think, I wonder how that person was before Jesus found them. Because creation and recreation are the business of God. He is into salvation and redemption. Beginning in August of last year, I decided to go on a transformation of my own, just with my health. I uh, saw a picture of myself at um, an eighth grade graduation at the, at the Lansing Church. And I thought, oh boy, that's not very flattering. And I was really not feeling good, had a lot of health issues. So I thought, this, in August I started, and I thought, I'm really going to put some effort into this. And I'll tell you what, transforming your health is very difficult. We all know as Adventists and people uh, who understand the health message, what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to do it. 
but it sure is a lot harder doing it than it actually is knowing about it. So I decided to go on this journey, and uh, I, I need the word of God to keep me on this journey because it's very difficult. And when I was baptized, I was baptized in 1993. I assumed that when I was baptized, I would go down into the baptismal tank. I don't see one here, but I'm sure you have one. Um, and I would come up with this brand new nature, and I would just be holy and uh, not tempted, and my old nature, temp temper, or whatever uh, was plaguing me would be gone. Well, it wasn't very much later. In fact, it was that very same day that I found out that that did not happen. So uh, little did I know that what I thought about going down into the baptismal tank was not what was going to happen. It's not a grave for the old nature. We've all probably heard that, that when you go down into the tank that your old nature dies and you come up with this brand new nature. Well, that's partly true. When you go down into the tank, it's not necessarily just a grave. It is also a womb for the new nature that God is birthing in you. And that new nature helps us to battle and fight the old nature. Um, those battles can be intense, and those battles can be, um, take a long time. Sometimes transformation of my character has been uh, quick and easy. Um, simple things like I never really smoked, I, maybe occasionally when I was with friends, when I was not in the church. And, um, but that was easy to give up. That was not anything that I really battled with. But there's other things. Um, sometimes those battles are short and quick and simple. Sometimes they're difficult and drawn out. Sometimes they take weeks and sometimes years. Some I'm still fighting. Some I have a period of victory and rest, and then I come back and that battle rages all over again. I've learned, as did Paul, that the death of the old nature comes daily. The old carnal nature must die every morning and truthfully throughout the entire day. Every moment of every day, we're dying to self. The old carnal nature must die every morning and every evening. And the new nature must be given new life. So transformation is simply a change. It's a turning away from one way and going in a new direction. I love English. I love words. That's how this sermon was started. One simple word, transformation. Um, and I had an English teacher who explained to me that all good storytelling centers around transformation of character. If you think of a simple story, um, familiar one from Christmas, the Christmas Carol, Ebenezer Scrooge starts out stingy and greedy and he, you know, is very tight with his money and mean to the people around him and all of a sudden he goes through a process and ends up with a transformation of character. A good story can be as complex as that or as small as a simple epiphany. In other words, transformation occurs when we learn something new about ourselves, our world, our relationships, and we desire and affect a change. All of scripture is filled with transformation stories, from the purity of Adam and Eve in the garden to their fall and on and on. Each and every character in the scripture is presented with opportunities to transform, to change, to grow, to be transformed by faith and trust in God or not. The Bible is the ultimate story of redemption and transformation. It's what makes it so interesting and a spectacular literary masterpiece. Today we're going to examine a couple of transformations in scripture. We'll look at Peter and Mary, where our scripture reading came from. Two very familiar characters with very interesting lives. And then we'll kind of break down the process of what happens during transformation and how that happens. But my prayer for you today is that you leave with encouragement and tools and uh, the strength and the power that you need to make and complete the transformation that Jesus is working in your life. So transformation definition is simply this. It's a complete or major change in someone or something's appearance, form, etc. It's an act or a process or instance of transforming or being transformed. Now, Jeremiah 13, 23 says, can a leopard change his spot? You guys know that scripture, right? An Ethiopian changes skin or a leopard his spots. It's impossible for us to do this in our own power. We need it. It's what God is asking us to do, but we're, we have an impossible task. We cannot do it on our own. I don't know about you or how you were raised, 
But when I look back at my life and I think of all the times that I tried to change a behavior that I knew was unhealthy or unproductive, I tried and tried and tried, but eventually I would always end up going back to that same behavior. So this little um, transformation table gives us a, just a visual of how transformation occurs. As a teacher, I'm not a teacher, but I've had teachers, and I've learned from them that when you learn something new, this is how you learn. You have a cognitive understanding in your brain, in your mind, you understand um, the information that you're getting, and then you have the understanding of it, and then you apply it. That is just very simply the brain process of learning. Faith learning happens by interest. You find something that interests you and you believe that, and then you love that thing. You know, that's the faith process of learning. The action process of learning is imitation. You see someone who's doing the things that you want to do or that's interested in the same things that you're interested in, and you imitate their behavior. And then you start practicing that behavior, and that behavior becomes a habit. Well, it also goes across the board, what I like to call level learning, and this is just how my brain works, so don't take it as gospel. It's just how Casey learns. So level one, if we're doing all three of those things across the board, you'd have information. So let's take my health, for example. I learn health information. I have an interest in that. And then I start imitating those people that I know that are healthy. And so that's a very uh, shallow level of learning. That's where you begin and how you start. And then the second level is you start getting an understanding of why they're doing what they're doing and what that's doing to your body and your mind. And then you start to believe in that thing. And then you start practicing that thing. Then level three is you start applying that consistently in your life. And then the big love part happens. It's, it's something that is outside of yourself. You have to have an appreciation and a love. If you take my health journey, my health transformation, I'm still at the love part because I have to keep going back to scripture and saying, okay, I love Jesus and this is what Jesus wants for me. And so it keeps you going until you can develop the habit of health. Does that make sense to everybody? You need to have that love. If you don't have love for what you're doing or what you're learning, um, you're not ever going to implement that as a habit. You'll just keep cycling back through the, the table. So slide five says, um, how does education begin? Or how does change begin? Education. Education is what it's all about. I mean, you guys live in a college town here in Grand Rapids, and um, the gentleman that was up here, I'm assuming, is a professor of some kind. And so education is super important. We, we, teach our children, we teach each other. Um, spiritual learning though, and we're talking about spiritual things. Spiritual learning targets change in character, growth, in love, faith, and conduct. The great object of Christian teachers is to facilitate a new birth and continual transformation of beliefs and practices. And that's difficult, I mean, it's hard to change. And Ellen White, and I hope it's okay to use Ellen White in our Seventh-day Adventist church because I do love her writings, believe what she says, and it has transformed my life. So I'm going to be using her. Um, to some of this work of entire transformation may seem impossible. But if this were so, why go to the expense, or expense of attempting to carry on a work of Christian education at all? Our knowledge of what true education means is to lead us ever to seek for strict purity of character. In all our association together, we are to bear in mind that we are fitting for transfer to another world. The principles of heaven are to be learned and practiced. The superiority of the future life to this life is to be impressed upon the mind of every learner. This work of transformation is difficult, and it takes time, and it takes effort. And it takes continual battle and struggle over self. But it is possible. We know that it's possible. So we're going to look real quick at Peter. Peter had quite the transformation in scripture. Um, Peter started out very self-sufficient, very um, brash and bold. You know the story of Peter. I don't have to explain it to you. Um, but in, in, first, or in Luke 5, 1 through 8, we get one quick, short example of how Peter was transformed according to the table that we just looked at. 
So if you read the scripture, it says, Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing about him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake. But the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and he asked him to put out a little way from the land. And I hope everybody understands that he is Jesus. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled the boats so that they, boat, they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish they had taken. And so also were James and John, son of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. So if we looked at, at the cognitive process that Peter had, he recognized Jesus as the master. He saw him, heard of him. This was, uh, as, as you notice, that it was after this incident that he followed him. So he wasn't following him at this time, but he had heard of him. And when Jesus said, you know, give me one of your boats, Peter said, yeah, okay, I've heard of you. You know, I've heard you teaching and people talking about you. Sure, take one of my boats. So he did. He took the boat, and Jesus calls him master at that point. He hears him teaching from the boat. He's, he's listening, as was everyone else around. And so who knows how long that lasted? I don't know, an hour or two, who knows? But he was listening, and he was developing faith, that second step in our learning process. He was developing a faith by listening to Jesus. Faith comes by hearing what? The word of the Lord, right? So he was developing that faith in Jesus, and then later, when Jesus says, um, put out the boats for fish, Peter's like, oh, I've, been, you know, I've been in this business. I know what's going on. We're not going to catch any fish right now. And, but he says, at your word. His faith was just small at this point. But he says, at your word, I'll put out and, and see what happens. And when he had caught all those fish, he realized he finally put his faith to action. And he fell down in repentance at Jesus' feet and says, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. I don't have faith. I don't have enough faith but I'm learning. And so Peter's transformation started just there. And then when he was done with all that, he said, Jesus said, follow me. And Peter said, okay, I'm good to go. I'm following you. And that is the learning transformation. So Peter, later on, as we know from Peter's story and from the scriptures, Peter went, goes through this process many times. And it's when Jesus finally uh, says to him, you know, you will deny me three times. And Peter's like, oh, no, 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 I won't. He does. And it's not until after that process that he finally comes to the, the final part of transformation, which is that love part. He actually really, at that point, loved his Lord so much that everything he did from then on became a habit. It wasn't something he had to think about. It wasn't something that he was ever going to turn away from. He was in love with Jesus, and his life became a habit of service and a habit of transformation. And that's how our lives can be too. And our second example is Mary Magdalene, and this is where our scripture reading comes from. So um, Mary, we pretty much know about Mary. She was possessed and freed of seven demons. In Luke 8, 1 through 3, it states this, and you can read this if you have time this afternoon. And seven is the perfect or complete number, su suggesting that she had been very grievously and repeatedly afflicted. In Matthew 13:39, the Bible states that she was from Magdala, a town on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, with a very poor reputation. And I'm just going to leave it there. Throughout Scripture, we see that Mary was the recipient of great salvation and forgiveness. She repeatedly showed her gratitude to the Lord by ministering to him. Evidently, Mary was a woman of some means. Uh, in Luke, again, it says that she provided for the disciples and for Jesus out of her substance. And so she obviously had some substance. So she was, um, some people see her as a woman of means. She helped provide for Jesus and the 12. 
and purchased a very expensive perfume. She became a devoted, faithful, and humble follower of Jesus. We see her throughout scripture near him, looking for him, ministering to him, caring for him. She loved him with all of her heart. She loved him so much because he forgave her so much. Mary had a miraculous but extended transformation. In the story found in our scripture reading today lies the key to her miraculous transformation, and not just hers, but ours. So we're going to find out what that key is. So in Luke 10, 38 through 42, lies the key to transformation. This is our scripture reading. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had called she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet concerning to what or I'm sorry, listening to what he had said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked him, "Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me." "Martha, Martha," the Lord answered, You are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. So let's think about a couple of questions. Where do we see Mary in this story, and in most of the Bible stories? Who said that? Jesus' feet. She was at Jesus' feet, absolutely. And uh, why was she there? Why was she at Jesus' feet? Oops, I'm sorry. Why was she there? What was she trying to obtain? I'm sorry? His company. His company. But there's more to it. She was trying to learn, right? Why do we go anywhere where someone's teaching or talking? Because we're trying to learn something. And she was also there for forgiveness. If you think of the story of um, when she was going to be stoned, she was at Jesus' feet for forgiveness. And that's why we go there too. And what did being in the presence of Jesus create in her? What did that produce in her, in her life? To be like him, character change, transformation. Mm -hmm. What happens when you spend a lot of time with somebody? You would get to love them, to appreciate them, to know who they are, to understand how they think. That's what was being created in her. And she was, and Jesus says that she's, let me go back. Jesus says in the end, Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. She was looking for a transformation, a forgiveness, something better than what she had before. And Jesus says she's going to find it, and it's going to stay with her. It's never going to leave. So when we're transforming our characters, the lesson that's there for us is that spending time with Jesus is something that is going to transform us and our characters, and it will never be taken away from us. And we'll see that a little bit later on with some some quotes that we have, that I have. Um, So yeah, our characters will be changed, and some things will start to happen, and we're going to kind of go through this quickly. And if you want to write down the scriptures or the references, um, please I'd be happy for you to do that and read those later on. So when we are in the presence of Jesus, several things will happen. I will, something will happen to me, to you. Um, Jesus will do something. And others will, something will happen with others. And we're going to go through it and see. So when I'm in the presence of Jesus like Mary was, I will recognize my sinful condition. Peter could not be in the presence of Jesus because... He was in the presence, but he recognized his sinfulness in the presence of his holiness. And it says, the word sanctifies. The scriptures are the great agencies in the transformation of character. Christ prayed, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. If studied and obeyed, the word of God works in the heart, subduing every unholy attribute. So when we come into the presence of God through his word, we are transformed by his word. The knowledge of God in Christ. The knowledge of God as revealed in Christ is the knowledge that all who are saved must have. This is the knowledge that works transformation of character. Do we know God? Do we know who he really is? Or do we think we know who he is? 
Have you ever gone to the scriptures and opened them in your daily devotionals and you thought, wow, I've never seen that about God before? Or you kind of know it, but when you're in the scriptures, you're like blown away by who he is. That's the knowledge that we have to have that works a transformation of character. Received into the life, it will recreate the soul and the image of Christ. In every generation and in every land, the true foundation for character building has been the same. The principles contained in God's word. The statutes of the Lord are right, and he that doeth these things shall never be moved, the psalmist says. When you are in the presence of God, you will repent. Peter repented, didn't he? He said, depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Psalm 51, we know that psalm, Psalm of David, very repentant for what he, he had done with Bathsheba, which is what we studied in Sabbath school this morning. Um, he says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, God, thou wilt not despise. And then Jesus himself says in Matthew 5, 6, blessed is he who hungers and thirsts after righteousness, for they shall be filled. When we come into the presence of God, we automatically see our sinfulness and humble ourselves before him in repentance. And Ellen White says in Acts of the Apostles, she says, in the life of the disciple, John's true sanctification is exemplified. During the years of his close association with Christ, he was often warned and cautioned by the Savior, and these reproofs he accepted. As the character of the divine one was manifested to him, John saw his own deficiencies and he was humbled by the revelation. Day by day, in contrast with his own violent spirit, he beheld the tenderness and forbearance of Jesus and heard his lessons of humility and patience. Day by day, his heart was drawn out to Christ until he lost sight of self in love for his master. The power and tenderness, the majesty and meekness, the strength and patience that he saw in the daily life of the Son of God filled his soul with admiration. He yielded his resentful, ambitious temper to the molding power of Christ and divine love wrought in him a transformation of character. So John even had a transformation, didn't he? When we're in the presence of Jesus, we will ask forgiveness. Uh, Ephesians 1 says, in him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Praise the Lord. Praise God that we have the forgiveness of sins. If we didn't have that, what would we do? Oh, it's just, it, it makes me tremble. In accordance with the riches of God's grace, by his words and his works, Christ testified to the divine power that produces supernatural results, to a future life beyond the present, to God as a father of the children of men, ever watchful of their true interests. He revealed the working of divine power and benevolence and compassion that rebuked the selfish, selfish exclusiveness of the Sadducees. He taught that both for man's temporal and for his eternal good, God moves upon the heart by the Holy Spirit. He showed the error of trusting to human power for that transformation of character, which can be wrought only by the Spirit of God. So when we're in the presence of Jesus, we will ask forgiveness and not only just ask it, we will receive it. And in the presence of God, we begin to have faith and believe what Jesus says. Hebrews eleven six says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. James 2, 23 says, And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. So when we're in the presence of Jesus, our faith is strengthened. And our faith pleases God. When we're in the presence of Jesus, we will die to self. Romans 6, 11 says, I hope you can see that, it's pretty small. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it says, at the time of their conversion and baptism, the Colossian believers pledged themselves to put away beliefs and practices that had hitherto been a part of their lives and to be true to their allegiance to Christ. In this letter, Paul reminded them of this and entreated them not to forget that in order to keep their pledge, they must put forth constant effort against the evils that would seek mastery over them. Are we still doing that? Because we're the Colossian believers. We've come to Christ, we've given him our hearts and our lives, and we've pledged to overcome these things and put them aside. Are we still working on that? Are we still transforming? The Colossian believers were, and, and Paul encouraged them. He says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, 
where Christ sits on the right hand of God, set your affection on things above, not on things on earth, for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Amen. Amen. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Through the power of Christ, men and women have broken the chains of sinful habit. Praise the Lord. Think about who you were before Jesus found you and saved you. Aren't you thankful that you're not chained to those sins? Praise God. You're set free, right? We're set free. Praise God. Through the power of Christ, men and women have, been broken, have broken the chains of sinful habit. They have renounced selfishness. The profane have become reverent. The drunken, sober. The profligate, pure. Souls that have borne the likeness of Satan have become transformed into the image of God. This change is in itself the miracle of miracles. A change wrought by the word, it is one of the deepest mysteries of the word. We cannot understand it. We can only believe, as declared by the scriptures, it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So when we're in Christ's presence, we will deny self and change. And finally, we will live for God. Romans 13, 14 says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh, flesh to gratify its desires. The time is now. This is a, a phenomenal quote, and I hope that you listen very closely to it. If you have become estranged and have failed to be Bible Christians, I don't know about you, but I certainly don't think of myself as a Bible Christian. They had faith and power that I feel like I don't have in my life. So I've become estranged from God. This, this just um, strikes through, cuts through to the core of my heart. For the character you're, you bear in probationary time will be the character you will have at the coming of Christ. If you would be a saint in heaven, you must first be a saint on earth. The traits of character you cherish in this life will not be changed by death or by the resurrection. If we think that by some miraculous miracle Jesus is going to take away all of those traits of character, the anger, the greed, the lust, whatever it is that you're dealing with, when he comes, that's not going to happen. We have probationary time now to put those things away. We have the plan on how to do it. We know what we should be doing. And what we, can, what we do and how we do that is spend time with Jesus. That's all we can do. We have no other power or um, prescription for overcoming sin. That's it. Spend time with Jesus. The work of transformation must be done now. Our daily lives are determining our destiny. Are you spending time with Jesus? Really? I have to be honest with you. When I started working at the conference office, before I started working there, I spent hours every day with Jesus. Hours studying, reading, praying, listening to things, um, watching things on 8, 3 ABN and on my computer. Wherever I could get time with Jesus, I was doing that. When I started working at the conference office, I got up at 5.30 every morning and had to be to work by 8. I have to drop my child off to school at 7 o'clock in the morning. I wasn't spending time with Jesus. And I could tell. And it, you can tell. We know when we're not spending time with Jesus. We know by the habits that creep back in, those battles that we fight, that we thought were over a long time ago, or dead, those things come back in. We know when we're not spending time with Jesus. And that's all we can do. If that's all we can do, we need to do it. Practical application for living for God. Our minds, we need to protect our minds. We need to think on pure things. If we're filling our minds with filth, our bodies and our thoughts are going to be filled with filth. So we need to keep things pure. Our environment, don't prepare for sin. Keep our environment free from temptation. It's very simple, practical things that we all know. I'm not telling you anything that you've never heard before. Um, but I hope that I'm encouraging you to make some changes, to actually apply some of the things that we know. And me too. I'm talking to me. Lifestyle. Change what we do, who we hang out with, what we listen to, what we view, what we eat, what we drink, etc. Very important. Very important. My husband is not in the church. He doesn't go to church very often, once in a while. But this is the hardest thing for him to do, is lifestyle change. And to be different. To be different. The who we hang out with is very important. 
And that's a difficult thing for, for people to understand. And conditions, if you have something that you're battling with, or something that seems to always come to the forefront and that you're really struggling to get, get over and get the victory over, make yourself some conditions. If you're a shopaholic or if you're an alcoholic or if you're um, somebody who's addicted to pornography or whatever it is that your issue is, and those are pretty extreme, but I'm just saying, whatever your issue is, make restrictions, make conditions. If you have to come in contact with temptation, have a plan in place. Um, I know somebody, I don't know if you know who um, Lisa and Don Savell are, but they just started a new program through Women's Ministries at the conference office called Uncompromised. Don was um, addicted to pornography for 35 years, and he's developed this program to help people with that problem. And he says now when he sees a billboard or somebody at the mall or the grocery store and his mind turns to those things, he has scripture cards that he keeps in his pocket. And he, as soon as he sees something, he pulls out the scripture card and he reads it. And it puts his mind back on Christ. You have to make those changes if you're dealing with something. If you're an alcoholic, don't walk down the aisle with the alcohol in it in the grocery store. Don't drive past the bars. Take the long way. You know, whatever it is you have to do, do it. So give yourself some restrictions. Take a chaperone with you. Have certain times that you know when, you know, the malls are not busy with young teenage kids who aren't dressed appropriately. Um, look at a budget if you're a shopaholic. Make yourself a budget. Whatever it is your problem is, have you some sort of accountability, something that's going to help you get the victory over that. Very important, simple, practical things. When we're in the presence of Jesus, Jesus will do a couple of things too. He'll become the object of our affection. When one turns away from human imperfections, to look around and see what everybody else is doing, spending time with Jesus, we behold him and a divine transformation takes place in the character. The Spirit of Christ works upon the heart and conforms it to his image. Then let it be your effort to lift up Jesus. Let the mind's eye be directed to the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. The follower of Jesus, Jesus should be constantly improving in manners, in habits, in spirit, and labor, but this is done by keeping the eye not on mere outward, superficial attainments, but on Jesus, the model. A transformation takes place in the mind, in the spirit, and in the character. Isn't that beautiful that all we have to do is go into the presence of Jesus and we can be transformed? It's pretty simple. I don't know why, and I think that's why the devil attacks that very thing. Because he knows when we're with Christ, we become like Christ. Very simple thing. So make it your effort and, and put some effort into it. Because it's so important. You're never going to change. I'm never going to change without it. Forgive, the clean, or forgive and cleanse. He will forgive and cleanse us. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he will also fill us with his Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord that he gives us a comforter. Uh, John 14, 15, and 16 says, If you love me, and when we love someone, we like to spend time with them, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. And when I'm in Jesus' presence, others will become important. Sometimes we can spend a little bit of time with Jesus, and start to make some changes and think that we're doing pretty well. But if we don't have a love and appreciation for others and they're not important to us, then we need to add a little more time to our, our devotions and our, our um, time with Christ. John 21, 15 says, When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus asked him that question three times. And finally, Peter says, yes, you know I love you. And Jesus says, then feed my lambs. If you love me, you're going to take care of my people, my flock. Redeem the time. We are admonished to redeem the time. But the time squandered can never be recovered. We cannot call back even one moment. The only way in which we can redeem our time, and thank God there is a way, is making the most of that which remains by being co-workers with God in his great plan of salvation or redemption. In him who does this, a transformation of character takes place. 
He becomes the son of God, a member of the royal family, a child of the heavenly king. He is fitted to be the companion of angels. Praise God. We can redeem the time. Whatever we've squandered or wasted, uh, whatever growth that we could have had that we don't have, it's all okay. Because as long as we start now, we can make the most of what remains and be transformed. Live an unselfish life. The badge of Christianity is not an outward sign, not the wearing of a cross or a crown, but it is that which reveals the union of man with God. By the power of his grace manifested in the transformation of character, the world is to be convinced that God has sent his son as its redeemer. No other influence that can surround the human soul has such power as the influence of an unselfish life. The strongest argument in favor of the gospel is a loving and lovable Christian. So others will become important. The more time I spend with God, the more others will become important to me. And we will also forgive them. And this is very, um, probably one of the sticking points that a lot of us get into is that we've been wronged, hurt, and it's so hard to forgive. But Jesus says, if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. Nothing can justify an unforgiving spirit. I could just stop right there. Nothing can justify an unforgiving spirit. He who is unmerciful towards others shows that he himself is not a partaker of God's pardoning grace. But if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his, Romans 8, 9 says. We are not forgiven because we forgive, but as we forgive. The ground of all forgiveness is found in the unmerited love of God, but by our attitude towards others, we show whether we have made that love our own. Wherefore, Christ says, with what judgment ye judge, therefore, I'm sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> with which, what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. If you feel like you can't forgive somebody and you know it within your own heart, I'm having a real hard struggle with this, Lord. Spend more time with God. That's all we can do. It's the answer to everything. Spend more time with God. Just spend time with him. Put CDs in your car. Put the television on 3ABN while you're cleaning the house. Whatever you have to do, spend time listening to him. Spend time hearing his word. Spend time studying. If you have to study in the evening because you have to get up too early, do it. Just do it. When I spend time with God, others will be the focus of my labor. Now is our time to labor for the salvation of our fellow men. There are some who think that if they give money to the cause of Christ, that's all they are required to do. The precious time in which they might do personal service for him passes unimproved. But it is the privilege and duty of all who have health and strength to render to God active service. All are to labor in winning souls to Christ. Donations of money cannot take the place of this. Every true disciple is born into the kingdom of God, a missionary. So when we're spending time with Jesus, all these things are going to happen. They're going to, we'll have repentance and faith and we'll notice things about ourselves and, and then we'll repent to the Lord and he'll forgive us and we'll, we'll be transformed. We'll love him. He will be with us. He will guide us and direct us with his spirit and he will give us compassion and love for other people. Those things only come through time with him. And Enoch is our final character and this is our last slide and I'll wrap it up. Enoch was very busy, and Enoch lived in a very difficult time. And Ellen White gives us a little bit of interesting uh, tidbit about what his secret to success was. In the midst of the life of active labor, Enoch steadfastly maintained his communion with God. That was a decision that he made. Steadfastly continued in his communion with God. The greater and more pressing his labors, the more constant and earnest were his prayers. He continued to exclude himself at certain periods from all society. After remaining for a time among the people, laboring to benefit them by instruction and example, he would withdraw to spend a season in solitude, hungering and thirsting for that divine knowledge which God alone can impart. Communing thus with God, Enoch came more and more to reflect the divine image. His face was radiant with a holy light, even the light that shines in the face of Jesus. As he came forth from these divine communings, even the ungodly beheld with awe the impress of heaven upon his countenance. 
And Enoch wasn't just transformed, he was translated. And eventually, some of us, maybe some of our children, I don't know, looking at the way the world is going, it may be some of us, are going to be translated as well. So my encouragement to you today is that transformation of character is the ultimate demonstration of the power of God in our lives. We were something before, we're going to be something else after. And we need to continue on in that transformation process. I encourage you to spend time with God. I encourage you to make that a choice and a decision. It's not always easy, but we need to do it. And we need to do it more than what we're doing. I don't think we can ever do it enough. Thank you for having me. And I think we have a closing hymn. Let's see, our hymn of consecration is 539. Would you stand with me?